a justice that God put in me, along with my love of black people, that I cannot do any man, white or black, harm unless it's justified. Hear me now. I was a young boy, 10 years old. This is 13, but this, this other incident that impressed itself on my life, I was 10 years old. And a friend of mine, I went to his home with my cousin. And he had a pearl-handled knife. <clears throat> it was a pretty knife. And I took the knife that night, stole it, put it in my pocket, went home. And my friend, who is dead now, came to my home the next day and asked me about that knife. And I lied to him, said, I, I saw it, but I, I, I didn't take it. I left it there, but I had it in my pocket. After that boy left, I was sick with myself because I lied and I stole. And from the time I was 10 years old, I ain't never stole nothing. That was the first and the last time I ever put my hand on something that did not belong to me. Some of you haven't learned that lesson yet. <laughs> My last point is, I was 16 years old, growing into my young manhood, and there was a little girl that really liked me. And we had this affair, whatever that means. And I was so proud of this affair, you know. I was telling all my friends this night in an apartment on the first floor, <clears throat> she was outside the window listening. When I knew that that girl heard me, I felt so bad that to this day I carry the pain of that experience, and from that day to this, I don't listen to nobody talking about how they misuse the woman. I don't respect nobody that talks about or misuses women, and from that day to this, I have never misused a woman. Now, I say that to say this, there are lessons in life that all of us go through. The question is, when you go through them, do you learn from them? And do they impress themselves on your character so that you become a different kind of person as a result of that experience? I'm saying that I learned from those lessons. And they help to mold the kind of character that I have. Through my music, I learned to love humanity. Not just black people. Black people were my focus, but all humanity I learned to love. But when I became a Muslim, under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and under the tutelage of Malcolm X, my focus narrowed down totally to black people. Totally. I didn't know I was being formed then. I didn't know. Always envy surrounded me in my upbringing. Whenever I would win the talent show or appear on television and whatnot, I always wanted to share what I had with my friends. And I found when I go to the pool room, they would, you know, look a little different at me. And envy start coming in when you start being separated from your friends for your gifts and your talents. And each one of us has to learn how to handle envy, especially when it comes from one of your own. In your own family, it's worst of all when you got a brother or sister that envies you. And it's hard as hell when it comes in your organization and in your people. Malcolm had to understand, as I mentioned last week, what envy and jealousy do. It is a fire that can burn you, but if you're being formed by God, he uses the fire to beat you into shape. Yes, Malcolm was envied by so many who claimed to be his brother. Yes, they hated him because he was so brilliant. Yes, they hated him because he was so popular. Yes, they hated him because he enjoyed the love of Elijah Muhammad even more so 
than even the children of the messenger. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's true. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They hated him for that. When the time came that Malcolm had to be spanked by his teacher, and all the time the messenger was directing heat to him, through the jealousy of the people, they were putting heat on Malcolm. How does Malcolm respond to the fire? Envy is a passion, but it also produces anger, which is another passion. These two fires can cancel each other out if you are not developed enough to control your anger to save the object that is envying you. Oh, it's a hell of a story. Brother. It's a hell of a story. Malcolm lost his life because he became angry with his teacher. And in that anger, he lost the ability to reason with what he was fighting against. And he was killed, assassinated. I'm not going to say Muslims had nothing to do with it. But I'm going to say the government had more to do with it than Muslims. Though we may have been very well involved. But two innocent men were in, uh, in prison. One of them just released, one of them still in prison for a crime they did not commit because it was necessary for the government to show that Muslims had killed Malcolm so that those who loved Malcolm would fight against those who loved Elijah Muhammad and we would cancel each other out. I didn't know that Elijah Muhammad was forming me all the time because I walked in Malcolm's shoes. And you don't know a man, brother and sister, until you walk some way in his shoe. None of you on the outside of Malcolm, on the outside of the nation, can appreciate what that means when I say I walked in Malcolm's shoes. You can't appreciate that because you had no relativity to Elijah Muhammad except a distant relativity. But I walked in Malcolm's shoes because I grew to become the national spokesman of Elijah Muhammad. You hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And as the more I spoke for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I gained the love of the masses of black people, but the envy and the scorn of many of my brothers who, and sisters who labored with me inside the movement. Yes, sir. And there came a time in my development where I thought that Elijah Muhammad was at the base of the problem. And in my own thinking, I thought, is he jealous of me, his student? Well, that's a vain thought in a student's mind. It could be real, but it could be vain. For why should a teacher who made you be jealous of you? It could be teachers get like that sometimes. But if a teacher gets like that, he's unfit to be a teacher. He's certainly not divine. But I saw into Elijah Muhammad after a while what I didn't see when I was going through all that pain. That pain was terrible to see brothers eating me up. And I never did nothing that I know of to any of them. I worked to fill up their mosques and then they would teach the people against me. I would bring money, mountains of it to the nation of Islam to have people talk about me. I fed most of these that were the laborers here in Chicago. We fed them from New York. But they hated me. Oh, but Allah is God, and he always has a plan. And his plan is greater than the plan of the envious and the jealous and the weak-hearted. But I didn't know Elijah Muhammad like I thought I did. And I began to think devious thoughts about my teacher until I told you last week he talked about that piece of board. That when you're going to use a piece of board to hold up the weight of a building, put it in the corner, you got to put a lot of stress on the board. And if it cracks, you throw it away and get another because a cornerstone has to be very greatly tried. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's why in the Bible, when you read about Jesus, the cornerstone, you read about a tried stone. You've got to be tried. And any of you that are Masons, you know that's what you say. I've been tried and never denied. And I'm willing to be tried again. Because trials, according to the Quran, purify you. They get you ready for service. My brothers ate my flesh. 
And in 1975, when Elijah Muhammad departed from us, there was an open season on Louis Farrakhan. Because Imam Warithuddin, as he ascended to the heights of leadership, the love in the masses of the people was for me. He was an unknown quantity. Yes, sir. So envy and jealousy caused them to remove me from New York. They didn't want me in a base of power because anytime a man can go out and 70,000 black people come out to him, he got a base of power in that city. And whenever I moved in New York, it was like God moving in Harlem. When I walked in Harlem, this is the God's honest truth, brother. The junkies would come out from where they were with their hands swollen, running to me to shake my hand, and they would wipe their hands on their clothes to shake my hand. They would bring their babies to me and ask me to bless their babies in the street because I was their brother and they knew I was their brother. These are the junkies, the people you think are no people at all. The prostitutes, they love Farrakhan because I love them and I fight for them even though I don't like their lifestyle. But I know it's not their fault. Take me away from that base and brought me to Chicago. And when they brought me to Chicago, they intended for me to die here. Not physically necessarily, but that too, if I had gotten out of line. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Finally, like the brothers of Joseph, they put me in a pit. <laughs> but they didn't know that God was in the pit with me. And when, and when I started, everybody laughed. Yes, sir. Some of you in this room were with me today hated me just a few years ago because you thought I was an enemy of Allah, an enemy of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and an enemy of the Imam. With all the Imam has said against me, I have never inspired one Muslim to say one negative thing about that man. I am like David, that even though Saul was after me and threw his spear at me, in the night I visited him and could have killed him, but I did not do it to show that I love the king and the king's son. Yes, sir. He's my father's son, and I would not allow nobody to do him no harm while I'm alive. This is the kind of man that they hated. I lost my religion. I mean, I went totally out. I threw away the Bible and the Quran. Lessons, everything. I didn't want nothing to do with no God, no religion, no nothing during that period. And I started traveling the world. And the more I traveled, the more I saw the rightness of Elijah Muhammad. So I came back and I decided, by the grace of God, to rebuild his work. And I say that to you to say this. I resubmitted myself to God. I did not know how I was going to do it, but I had faith that it could be done. I'm saying to you, beloved, if you want to grow into godliness, if you want to grow into the path of God, you have to submit to the teacher from God. And you have to exhibit the faith and the complete trust and confidence in God enough so that you will get out of the boat and walk on the water. Now, what was the problem with Jesus' disciples? What was the problem? What was it? They didn't have no faith. Jesus kept telling them, look, what I do, you can do. All the things that Jesus did, he told Peter and all of them, you can do the same thing I do. You just got little faith. When he got out of the boat and started walking on the water, he looked back and said, Peter, come on. See, boats are kept up by the law of buoyancy. And when you're on a boat that is under the law of buoyancy, there's a fair degree of security on the water. There ain't no security when you step out of the boat and try to walk. But they saw Jesus walking on the water. Now listen, this is all symbolic. It means something. Ain't nobody walk on the water. Yes, 
He said, Peter, come on. And as long as Peter kept his eye on him, he was doing all right. When Peter began to say, damn, look, I'm walking. <laughs> Peter began sinking. The idea is your confidence has to be so much in the master that you don't look at yourself and think about you. You think about the master and your desire to walk after him. And you start doing impossible things. I say that to say this. Faith and submission along with patience are prerequisites to ultimate victory over self. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Submission, number one. Faith and then patience. Oh, look, brother and sister, I'm almost finished. When I said I believe in God, the Quran says, does men think they'll say they believe and will not be tried? Anytime you say you believe in God, do you expect to be tried? Didn't Jesus give you a parable of these different hearts that received the truth? One of them, the truth fell by the wayside. I mean, you receive the truth with joy, and the wicked one comes, snatches it right out of you. Another one received it on stony ground, which means that it didn't take fertile root and the cares of the world. And by and by, persecution comes on account of the word, and the weeds and the thorns grow and choke out the seed, and it becomes unprofitable. It's the way many of you are. You can accept the thing as long as you don't have to pay no price for it. But when you got to pay a price for what it is you want out of life, you find out how little you really want it. When I used to play the violin in my grade school, little boys would come up to me and say, man, how you play the violin like that? How long have you been?